Good afternoon, good morning, and welcome everyone to today's special webinar, a Q&A session specifically for our last two webinars on Open Notes with Jeannie Webster, Christina Hsu. I'm Andrew Nuesco, Project Coordinator for Transforming Chaplaincy, and we are delighted you could all join us. Just some housekeeping instructions from the top. You are listening in using your computer speaker system by default and are muted. We have the opportunity to submit text questions to our guests by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel that's located on the side of your screen. You can send them in anytime during the presentation and we'll collect these and, and answer them throughout the special session. If you have any tech questions regarding audio or visual, put those into the chat box and I'll see those and get to those as soon as I can. And uh, without further ado, Jeannie Wurpsa. Great. Welcome, everyone. Um, we are thrilled that we have been able to set aside a small amount of time here to follow up on the webinars that we've been hosting related to Open Notes and the Cures Act. Um, we have today with us, as Andrew mentioned, a couple other speakers who were have been involved in those uh, webinars. I'm going to let them introduce themselves, just tell you where they're from. Christina? Hi everyone, I'm Christina Shu. I'm a chaplain in at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles, and I'm the co-convener along with Jeannie of the Transforming Chaplaincy Research Network for Chaplaincy Functions, um, and documentation and open notes falls under that. So I'm happy to be here with you. Great, Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah Byrne Martelli. I'm the Palliative Care Chaplain and Bereavement Coordinator uh, for the Palliative Care Division at Mass General Hospital in Boston. And Paul. Hi, my name is Paul Galeshoot. Um, a lot of people ask me how to pronounce my last name. It's kind of like Parachute. And I am um, by day a research staff chaplain with a company called M Health Fairview. I'm located up in Minnesota, connected with the University of Minnesota Medical Center. And I get to be the convener of the Hospice Palliative Spiritual Care Research Network with Transforming Chaplaincy. And uh, I also get to work as an instructor with Research Literacy 101. Please consider doing that. Thanks for letting me offer a little commercial there, Jeannie. There you go. Um, and you guys may or may not know me. I'm Jeannie Werpsa. I uh, mostly do medical ethics now at Northwestern Memorial Hospital in downtown Chicago, um, but I have been a chaplain for 25 years and I still have a point two assignment in our department as research chaplain um, and am fortunate to be connected with Transforming Chaplaincy and um, have been hosting some of these forums. So we are assuming, and I know it's a big assumption, but here's hoping, um, that each of you have already viewed perhaps one, but perhaps both of the webinars that we offered on Open Notes. The first one was with Steve O'Neill um, through the Open Notes project, and he talked about um, kind of using the mental, the experience of mental health care providers, um, and then thinking, starting to kind of lean in to think about what implications that would have for chaplains. Our last webinar. Um, again, hopefully you were able to watch it, focused both on what we consider to be kind of emerging best practices. We don't really have any evidence, but consensus experience um, for chaplaincy documentation and chaplain specific concerns, right? Again, we have a, a discipline that um, is very different from the rest of our colleagues. And so some of the concerns that were raised in that session um, again, pertain mostly to us, though there was some overlap and we did draw upon some of the research out there on the Cures Act more generally and on um, charting on more sensitive areas, how to make uh, notes friendly to our patients um, and accessible. So again, we're assuming that you have watched those. Um, during that session, there were some questions that came up. Um, we have um, I have answered those, and what I'd like to do is actually just start with some, I put the questions from the last seminar, webinar, into four major buckets. Um, the, there's three of the buckets that I can pretty quickly answer, so if you have questions that fall under this, maybe I will have, again, kind of taken care of them up front. And then the largest bucket um, of questions has to do with I think kind of the heart of what we're here for today, to really discuss with one another, how do we change our language? To what degree? How do we ensure that um, sensitive topics that we encounter all the time are approached 
um, appropriately in documentation. And that's where we, I'm fortunate to have our colleagues here, Sarah and Paul and Christina, um, to join in sharing their both experience using um, documenting in the medical record, but also um, just their experience as seasoned chaplains. So please, as we said, start to type your questions in the chat box. No, Q&A box, not chat box. Chat box is for logistic questions. Q&A is for us today, sorry. Um, okay, so here's the first bucket of questions that came to us. Um, they were questions about, I work in hospice or palliative care. I um, work in pediatrics. I am mostly in a psychiatric setting. What are the differences in terms of chaplaincy documentation um, for those specific areas? And my answer, um, and I think our general answer to you today is the Open Notes Movement, opennotes.org, has incredible resources for those disciplines, for palliative care and hospice, for pediatrics, for um, mental health notes. And more recently, they actually did a special webinar for oncology clinicians as well. So I'm going to redirect you back to those resources because they are the ones who've been using this, doing this for 10 years. They have talked to people that have done um, incredible work to help refine tools as well that you can download from their website. So anything specific to certain areas of care, again, um, I would redirect you there. The second um, set of questions um, had to do more with kind of logistics about the Cures Act, about when is my institution going to release these, which notes will they, what, what mechanism will be in place to not share a note with a patient. Um, so let me just answer a couple of things very quickly. Our understanding is that when notes are made accessible beginning around April 1st, 5th, beginning of May, depending upon your institution, um, it will only be notes from that current time, date and time moving forward, right? So whatever that encounter is, they will not be sharing all of the patient's medical record um, to date before that encounter, before that visit, for that inpatient admission um, post April 5th. However, that said, we know that patients can always request um, access to their entire medical record. That would include all of our notes as well. Um, so they can go down, they can put in one of those requisite forms and make that happen. But for this open notes change in the Cures Act, it will be from April 5th moving forward or whatever date your institution is actually opening up the medical record. Um, and again, we know that this is a logistical nightmare for our IT people, our EPIC people. So exactly when and how they're doing it, talk to your institutional representatives. We are aware, and I have been made aware clearly from uh, my own institution, that the regulatory um, specifications from the Cures Act are being followed in very different ways by different institutions. The degree to which institutions have communicated these changes and prepared their clinicians varies greatly. So again, um, if you're trying to figure out, will chaplain notes really be shared? Which ones? We just learned that potentially social work and chaplain notes from our institution won't be shared. We've been under the assumption they had to be shared. So again, I'm gonna redirect you back to your IT, corporate compliance managers um, for some of those questions. And then under this set of questions, there's only one other question I wanna answer from the previous seminar. And that is, we have such a high patient volume. We see so many patients. How can we possibly pay this much attention to charting? Um, and specify every note and make sure it's in the form it should be. And again, this is kind of a logistic question. And the answer that we proposed, I think, didn't address it any in any depth in our previous webinar, um, but touched upon was, you know, I think the, the length of your note, the content of your note, the kind of note will depend on the kind of visit. And for notes where you have been and are involved in complex patient care issues, longitudinally over a long period of time, 
have an ongoing relationship, there's acute issues, those are probably the notes you're gonna wanna take more care with. The one-offs, the quick visits, the patient who quickly dies in the ED, who you do grief support with, you know, I don't know that you're gonna have to change your note all that much or give it that much more attention, right? So um, I guess that's just one idea that at least I have, and we can come back to that if people have other ideas. Then finally, I just wanna remind us today, this is the third set of questions that came through um, in the Q&A uh, from the last webinar, is that questions about, do you have a general template for charting? How should we chart about families? Um, general questions about charting. What you know assessment categories do you use? Do you use process categories? Do you use more narrative or check boxes? Those are way beyond the scope of what we're talking about right now. These webinars are designed to help you prepare for this change, right, to your documentation. What we do know is that there's a lot of work going on in research on documentation more generally, sharing resources. We've tried to do some of that. And we did just learn, you all may have seen it, that APC announced that they're going to be sharing or developing a, a template for documentation within EPIC that's going to be made available to any users of EPIC. So there's lots of work behind the scenes on trying to standardize to some degree our practices for documentation. But again, that falls outside of the scope of our webinar and of this Q&A session. The last big bucket, now I'm going to stop just chatting away, um, has to do with language. How do we really address sensitive topics? So the questions that came through ranged from should we use first person or third person language? Um, what about documenting again on in a patient's chart who will be accessing their own chart on the care I provided to a family, right? And maybe that would be distressing to the family. What about sensitive topics like patients expressing guilt, um, need for confession, reconciliation, substance abuse, family dynamics that's causing the patient stress or vulnerability around even disclosing and talking about spiritual distress. In our last webinar, we did do most of our time under the guidance and the expertise of Sarah and Ben and um, Chaba really had to do with some of those topics. We developed a tip sheet, Christina and Sarah and some of the rest of us um, that we refer you back to for some samples of language to use, how to actually talk with patients about um, which sensitive topics you might be documenting on in advance so they're not surprised, getting their permission to do that. So some of that can be found in a resource sheet, this tip sheet that you can now access under handouts in today's Q&A session um, and was made available both on Transforming Chaplaincy Mighty Network's website as well as um, if you participated in the last webinar. So with that, I want to actually then open up the conversation um, and give Sarah, Christina, Paul a chance to respond, especially to this last big bucket of concerns about language. Um, do you want me to ask specific questions back to you guys, kind of put them, go back to the questions that were asked? Are there questions already emerging in the Q&A under this topic, or do you want to just jump in? Can I add one? I want to jump in one little thing just regarding like your, I think your third bucket that sort of is beyond the scope of our practice, but just about like notes and checklists and narratives. Okay. I did have a couple people reach out to me, kind of colleagues maybe within my own system who asked about like, do you do check boxes? Where do you do the narrative? How do you set that up? And so one thing I, I think that I can recommend is, you know, most people I think have a mix of check boxes and you know, and check boxes are there for a reason, right? We can track data. I mean, there, there's a lot of reasons to have it um, to kind of standardize language, but also we always want to have that narrative. And one thing that I think is really helpful is just to make sure your narrative is the first thing anyone sees, I think, because oftentimes clinicians, in my experience, for 20 years, people, they're kind of, they if they read your note, it's a relatively cursory skim. And so they're gonna want to see like the good stuff at the beginning. So I do try to start with my narrative. Um, 
you know, like the checkboxes populate the, the thing. And then, but to have like a three or four sentence narrative that includes all of the, the good stuff that I think is really important in terms of our assessment, our insight from that particular visit, anything that's changed in terms of the plan of care and any quotes from the patients, you know, it's nice to have maybe one or two kind of key words or phrases, but to do your best to make it be front and center, um, I think is helpful and that and and for some folks I think they were doing all the check boxes and putting the stuff at the bottom but I recommended kind of switching it um, yeah. I think I appreciate Sarah about that recommendation it's a reminder that we are primarily documenting for our colleagues right so again even as we're starting to let our um, thinking about our patients always been sitting on our shoulder could always read our notes but now we're more aware of that we really still, this is about the care plan. This is about what do our colleagues need to know. So hopefully we all have been thinking about that as we document and very intentional about, again, I learned a whole lot of stuff that they don't need to know, what's relevant, what's not. So again, charting 101, thinking about what we document um, and highlighting for our colleagues, again, what's most important. Yeah. Like they don't need to read every time, like, you know, demographic check boxes. That's not what the stuff that they need to know. What they really need to know is what's changing, what's new, what's staying the same, and what we're looking forward to, you know, to working on what interventions. Yep. I know, Paul, just on this topic quickly, you've had, you've done some research, at least within palliative care. And one thing we know is that somehow, reminding our colleagues who the patient is. Their patient story is also really one of the, the, the primary functions of our documentation, right? Yes. Um, and that would probably be a nice segue into patient recognition of themselves as well. Anything you wanna add? Yeah, yeah just to um, add that you're right, that's what some of the research bore out that the uh, paradox of it was, we do wanna hear more of that, but not too much, especially if it's relevant to the uh, patient care and what well, the um, focus group research found also exactly what you were just talking about. I know all this I've read in our chart review from like a physician progress note, like at the top above a line is the most important findings relevant. And I think that's exactly what they would want from us too. However it's framed, granted we probably wouldn't be writing most important findings, but if it is a story element or a narrative uh, piece, especially relevant to decision making or anything kind of related to pain or symptom management, looking at that through a uh, palliative lens, I th yeah, certainly, I think it needs to be prioritized to the top of, uh, of a progress note. Yeah. Great, thank you. So this is a nice segue though into how do we represent the patient to our team members, right? But also knowing that the patient will be reading the note how do we take care with these sensitive areas that we talk about? Um, and I know there's a lot of questions about that. So Sarah, do you wanna just take a stab at some general guidelines or kind of thoughts that you've had experience with this? Sure. I think um, for me as a palliative care chaplain, you know, we, I do a lot of joint visits and I, I we do a lot of goals of care, family meetings and that kind of thing. So I think, um, there's a lot of kind of free code phrases we use a lot, um, which can be helpful, but it's also helpful to remember that a lot of our colleagues outside palliative care, are, you know, the primary team is also looking at our notes. So um, again, to, to use broad strokes, but also, to highlight what you're thinking about, what the patient is concerned about. I can think about some patients that I've had recently who have been maybe having palliative treatment but are hoping to be on the transplant list and are in this very in-between place. And um, so one thing that we were talking about within our, our group meeting and then also with the patient is kind of navigating uncertainty or navigating the struggles, some family concerns with this patient. So, you know, I'm not gonna say like, patient is afraid he's not gonna be listed on the transplant list. That's too literal, okay? But he is concerned about, he is focusing on uncertainty. He's, he feels that he's in, a, he's in a place of uncertainty. He's hoping that, he, you know, he remains hopeful that he, um, that his treatment will, you know, will help his quality of life as well as extend his life. He, while also remaining mindful, you know, of, you know, the, how serious his illness is, that kind of thing. So yeah. just, um, I feel as though, and sometimes we, we actually do need to almost advocate for the patient within our notes in a gentle way to the rest of the team 
to share, you know, in a, in a way that is um, mindful that the other teams are also working very hard to do what they do best in the best interests of the patient. So, um, but it's okay to acknowledge uncertainty. It's okay to acknowledge struggle. I would use the word struggle. I would quote the patient saying things like, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, you know, I'm taking it one day at a time, or, you know, I'm holding on to hope, or, and, you know, any of those kinds of phrases that just, again, hold the patient up as a, a person with hopes and dreams and concerns. Um, again, I might, I am very cautious about referring to substance use disorders or any kind of specific mental health questions, I might say, if the patient brings it up, I might say that they bring up that particular topic, but as that is really outside the scope of my practice, um, I might just sort of allude to it as a topic, um, you know, and then we'll say something about like collaborate with XYZ person. So I really try to show any collaboration that I'm doing. If I talk to their nurse, if I talk to the psychiatrist, if I talk to the primary team, to be clear about that too, to show that we're working together, um, and that if a subject came up that was beyond the scope of my practice, I followed up with someone who could attend to it, even if I can't. And to be okay with that and to really understanding um, what I'm focusing on and how that overlaps with others. Um, and to be okay with leaving some things unsaid. Paul, you want to jump in for a second here? Well, I, I, and you all know, it's, I, Christina is in the palliative care world, and I used to be in the palliative care world on an active basis. and. Um, the research that we did, this isn't in any of the, the manuscript I'm working on as well as the one that came out of the focus groups, but one of the quotes from the physicians said, I can remember three instances where I got vital information from a chaplain that should never have been in a progress note, but if it wasn't shared at rounds or shared on the hall, in the hallway, it, would, it wouldn't have changed the care as it should have. So this introduces something else as well, like how, what goes in the note, what should go in the note, but what is really important for our interprofessional colleagues to know as it relates to the really pertinent relevant care that is uh, shared between us. Right, and so are there other modes by which you could share some of that? Um, and even, even through email sometimes, we have really complex cases. We'll sometimes do an exchange among team members behind the scene because everybody kind of needs to know don't yet tell them the family wants to disclose to the patient x y and z um, exactly sarah i wanted to ask you a little bit more like within our ballywick or our scope of practice when we're talking with a patient about spiritual distress as we call it um, how would you handle that how would you document on that would you tell them you're going to document on it what kind of language would you use now that you know that their eyes are also gonna be on it and they're vulnerable and yet we're entering into this kind of private sacred place with them where they're fessing up their deepest, darkest struggles, right? Um, I think so even just doing the process of doing this, these webinars and doing this has made me think even more and be even more intentional about talking with the patient about my role in the team to refer to colleagues like, oh, you met with so-and-so doctor who I work with, and I sit right next to her and we talk, and um, to, to talk about how I do document in the chart. And I think that most of the time, patients are like, they're, they're, they appreciate that knowledge. They, it, it almost, it might, it might heighten the conversation in a certain way or heighten the intensity of the conversation, and it makes it seem, you know, like I'm talking to the chaplain and, and this is part of the team. And I think it, honors the role that spirituality and existential stress really do play into care and into coping. Um, when a patient ex you know, is expressing spiritual distress, whether it's like theological, relationship with God, relationship with community, church community, sense of self, loss, all those kinds of things, um, I mean, I think I document just the tip of the iceberg to be completely honest. Like I definitely don't get into past stuff. I may allude to something like, for example, um, patient used to be involved in a religious community. Um, over time, that relationship has changed and now they are interested in reconnecting with a higher power. Like that, I think, I mean, that's what I would write. I don't know if that's best practice, but that's what I would say. Um, or a patient, um, you know, I, I have a patient, it's actually interesting, who's been, who from a while ago, who was, um, was really experiencing 
such loss and such isolation and such a so many losses and so much spiritual spiritual distress that was sort of unspoken but we all knew it was happening but she really wasn't able to share but over time she was able to open up more and um for her she's an artist and so for her it became like she was able to share that being you know disconnected from her art practice from her creative practice which is connected to her sense of identity and self you know she she was distressed distressed about this and now that we've been able to talk about it you know we've outlined a couple ways that she can reconnect with this and so you know patient has a new journal and has paints and has all these things and has been you know engaging practices um to relate to the spiritual distress so i think i try not to just like throw out spiritual distress and then just leave it you know i try to be clear that like they brought this up and here's why they brought it up and here is what we're talking about as a resource and this is what we're going to do going forward and then to revisit that hopefully in my next note if i do see them again um patient remains um you know remains in a place where they're um, coming to terms or adjusting to illness, that kind of thing. Um, but again, I really don't spell out a ton of really specific stuff about, um, you know, about their distress because I don't think I would want someone else to do that for me. Like I would be okay with someone saying, Sarah is struggling um, with feeling connected to God. That to me feels broad enough and specific enough to be meaningful, but I wouldn't want them to get all into, you know, every single piece of my own personal spirituality. I don't think that's really, I don't really think people want to hear that. Um, and that I don't think people want to read that in the chart necessarily. Um, well, that, and it goes back to the question too, doesn't it, Sarah, about do our team members need to know that in order to care for our patient? They might need to know that it's impacting their ability to make a medical decision, yes. that they're feeling guilt and therefore they can't move forward with X or they're, mm -hmm. Um, again, the distress that they're experiencing, the struggle is because the treatment's so harsh, right? right. Definitely. Um, that connection, I think, between what's going on spiritually and the impact on the care, the coping that we really need to highlight. Anytime I hear anything about hope and miracles and that kind of thing, that's when I might get a little more granular and more detailed, especially when you know they're like, um, can you see this patient? They're hoping for a miracle. And you're like, okay. Tell me more, what does that mean? What does that look like for you? So I, you know, we know that hope and miracles can mean many different things for many different people and impact decision-making in totally opposite ways sometimes. So I think that's when, you know, where the rubber hits the road for chaplaincy in many ways is to say, this patient is hoping that, you know, because of their belief about, you know, God as, you know, or the, the way they look about, look at life or the way they look at this matriarch of their family as having, you know, survived through so many things in the past and has previous experiences of miracles. And so this, I, you know, I've been talking to them about how their previous experience of miracles is, is, you know, encouraging them to see this as yet another opportunity for a miracle. Hence, they want to, you know, continue to pursue aggressive treatment or something mm -hmm. like that. So like I would be pretty clear when like previous experience of miracles and or this idea that like we have to do everything um, is related to spiritual or religious coping, you know, because we have to explain that stuff because otherwise I think it is easy, understandably for the medical team to kind of just think like they're hoping for a miracle, like the end, but that's not really the end, right? Um, it, it often has to do with legacy. It has to do with previous experiences of abandonment or marginalization or loss. Um, you know, we can really contribute more understanding that the team needs to see. Yeah, really lovely. Yeah, thank you. This um, <clears throat> actually kind of, I think, transitions us nicely into a question too about many of these cases involve families. Um, so our care in the intensive care units, um, in a bunch of other different units, if we're caring for children, certainly it's often to the family. So I'm wondering, um, since that was another big bucket of questions, like how do we document in the patient's chart? Let's assume the patient might be reading it. I think if the patient's not ever going to be reading it, and it's a family member who might have access, that's different, right? So palliative care, we often have that too. We know the patient, you know, isn't going to be doing this. 
But if we're concerned that the patient themselves might see what we did with the family or how they were coping, and that might cause them distress, um, what difference would that make now that, um, again, with open notes? And Paul or Christina, if you want to jump in and talk about this as well. I was just going to, um, uh, yeah, try to ask that question. And I think, especially in palliative care, but also in other types, there's situations where you're right, like we anticipate the patient might never um, uh, be awake or alert enough to read their note. But also there are times when we might have had a previous conversation with the patient and then they lose that ability. And then um, there's information already about a patient that their family can access. Um, and that might also change their dynamic, particularly related to um, goals of care. Um, like I'm thinking of patients who say, I'm doing all of this for my family. I don't really want to continue, but my family does. Um, or also things, I'm curious about things related to spirituality. So I'm thinking of patients who share like, oh, I'm not, not really into all this religious stuff, but I'm doing it for my family. And the family's like really concerned about their, you know, afterlife or something, um, how to document those types of things. Great questions. I, I guess I just want to say, I think that whoever asked the question in the webinar before us noted that we are one of the teams that does count the family as our patient, right? In pediatrics, that's a given. In hospice care, that's a given. But at least in the inpatient setting or some of the clinic settings, we do think that they deserve as much care um, and we know we're more attentive to the relational aspects. I think the family dynamics, we know we do a lot of work in there. So um, it's an ongoing challenge. Well, I think it's interesting too. Sometimes we have families that may be having interesting complex dynamics or the style of spiritual or religious coping is different amongst family members. Like one family member is like, believe in, you know, I mean, I can think of family meetings where they're like, do you not believe the word of God? Like, you don't believe that God's going to heal you? Like, where's your faith? Like, why is your faith not strong enough? And the patient's like, you know, tr trying to, you know, but the patient is the one actually experiencing this physical experience of illness. And, and so I think we can, again, allude to that. You could say things like, um, you know, within the patient and, you know, within the family, we discussed you know, the role of faith or the role of trust in God as we approach illness, you can say it in a general way, alluding to some like variation in belief without saying like the mom was giving the son a hard time for not having enough faith. You know, we can, we can allude to that. Um, but um, I think we also want to be careful. Like we don't want a lot of surprises in the chart, right? We don't want to to you know be talking to the wife you know on the phone and then document something and then the patient reads it like we don't want the patient to find I, I think we need to be careful we don't want to surprise the patient with information that we got from their family member i think it would be better to kind of be communicating together and to try to have more open communication and not sort of triangulate these different relationships too because that could be a little bit tricky um yeah, and again, like a quote here and there, I think is helpful. Um, but I, I think I err on the side of saying less, <laughs> certainly, especially around, you know, sometimes we have patients where, you know, situations where um, the some people want to know more prognostic information and others want to know less. And so that can be difficult too. I mean, right, they might say like, don't tell our mom you know, that her cancer has returned, that kind of thing. So to think again, carefully about that, we don't want to, to you know, shock someone with information that they really didn't want to receive. So, so again, it just kind of goes back to having communication within your team and within, you know, working with your colleagues to know like, so we're all on the same page as much as we can be. Yeah. Any other thoughts, Paul or Christina? Yeah, I, I would just add, I think this is probably in the tip sheet. I didn't look at it right before we hopped on, but it, certainly like everybody is saying, avoiding the speculation. Uh, I'm, I'm somebody who is risk averse to ever using the word seems or appears in any kind of progress note. Um, uh, I, I like to use the language of we when I am talking with a family member. We discussed, we talked about, um, so it's not like a surprise. And so it, in as much as it's possible, just like you said, Sarah brings in the quotes, 
and seeks to have this collaborative piece kind of moving forward, not to the to point where we're going to say, I'm going to write this in the note, but but nearly, I'm hearing you saying, and so forth and so forth, so it's not a big surprise. I also sometimes normalize things, like understandably, the family is in very different um, places in terms of acceptance or hope or something like that, um, which then, again, it's it's more different perspectives. It's objective rather than attaching it to a person and making it. I do refer to conflict sometimes, though. I think that it's not, it's, you know, if the patient is clearly, there's lots of family dynamics, the team's aware of those, we're negotiating those, and I also do ethics documentation, right? So we're often embedded in it. I think, you know, that's why we're there. So if the patient, again, let's assume we're involved with the patient to some degree, they're going to know that's all going on, right? So I think maybe acknowledging that with them, you know, we know there's a lot of stress around some of these dynamics. Um, I'm trying to give some guidance to the team, you know, about who to talk to and who not to talk to or something like that in my note. Um, I might, I, so I might be referring to them or to this conflict, uh, kind of a heads up. Christina, you're monitoring the Q&A. Yes, What's I coming? am. Um, I do have a couple questions I want to ask, but I, I did want to say, you know, I think similarly to having transparency with patients that we are documenting and having that conversation, you know, sensitively, it also seems like the same sort of transparency and avoiding triangulation and avoiding surprises with patient family or patient medical team dynamics. And I think of um, things that I often say to either patients or family members, such as, you know, have you discussed this fear or worry with the person that you're having it with, not just with me, and then encouraging them. I think, you know, your family member might be really receptive to hearing this from you, and it might be really valuable. Um, and then you can document that you discuss family dynamics and encourage the patient. Um, but it's really encouraging open communication um, for the benefit of, of patients and families. And I think that can be like a really great gift um, for people. Thanks for lifting up one of the gifts of open notes too, because I think it reminds us that all of these things that we probably should already be doing are really good practices, right? So thanks, Christina. Yeah. And one well, tiny um, thing that I, that I think about re related to that too is I think it's okay. Sometimes I use the expression like, patient continues to have questions about X, Y, Z. And so, you know, it, it, it doesn't sort of throw anyone under the bus, but at the same time, it, it shows that there's like, there's still some things that need to be discussed more clearly. There's still some communication that might, that needs to happen or patient is still wondering about the impact of this treatment or, you know, any number of, of interventions. But so patient continues to wonder X, Y, Z or has questions or family had many questions about the impact of this. Um, so then maybe the provider will read that and be like, oh, okay, actually, let me give them a little extra time to talk about this with me. Nice. Yeah. That ties, there's just a recent question about charting a patient's complaint about staff or medical teams. Um, so I think that for things that are like you, like Sarah mentioned, um, they have questions about their care, they're not un fully understanding, there's been some miscommunication, you know, charting something like patient continues to have questions or um, feels uncertain or, or feels, um, uh, like they would like more information about this, and then encouraging the patient to bring it up, encouraging their family member to ask questions, and then maybe without charting, telling we can tell nursing, we can tell other medical teams. Um, I think it would really um, benefit them to if you spent more time talking about this. Um, if it is a more serious complaint about um, really specific behavior, I think. Um, that also should not be in the chart, but we should, again, directly talk with a patient and maybe other medical teams um, and within your institution about how patients can make a complaint. If it's in my you know, hospital, it's like you can file a formal complaint through patient relations, um, or it might, if it's something nursing related, I might say, do you want me to get the charge nurse or the nursing administrator for this floor for you? Um, things like that. Yep, thank you. Um, there's a couple questions about shadow charting or um, 
uh, keeping a separate chart for oneself or uh, with additional information that might not be relevant to the chart or might be too um, personal or you know um, that you don't want to put in. I'll say a few words about that. So um, we so both in my ethics and spiritual care practice, I never keep a, a, a formal shadow chart. So I'm putting minimally minimal amounts of information in the patient chart. And then I've got, again, kind of all those chart notes and everything else kind of plus here. But what I do keep sometimes are notes to myself about things that I need to remember about a patient or a family situation. And most of us are pretty used to this by writing verbatims, right? There's tons of stuff in verbatims and we take notes so that we can write them in our training. Um, there's a lot of information in there that we find relevant to our own growth, to our own practice, to grounding ourselves again, or to remembering who this patient is and what they told us because we know that's going to be important, but the team doesn't need to know. Um, I think the challenge of double charting is, well, first, anything you write in your own computer, could it be accessed in a lawsuit, right? So it's not actually non-disclosable or non-discoverable, right? It's discoverable as well. Emails are discoverable. Um, so if we're worried about liability, that's not gonna help us. So again, what's really the purpose of keeping in some extra notes for certain patients? And I would say it's a, for specific to certain patients or family cases that you need to do that for, that you might do that for. Sarah, Paul, Christina, any additional thoughts? Uh, yeah, my, my thoughts are related to, I think it depends on what type of EHR people use or EMR, but there are some pieces. Um, so I use Epic and I've recently learned that, you know, in the U.S., two thirds of all people have an Epic note um, somehow connected to their medical record. So it's, I know it's the most used out there. Things like sticky notes that do not go after if it's an inpatient admission. I also use this function called InBasket that I'm told does not succeed by that, so it's a way for us to communicate with each other in a way that um, keeps temporal and relevant data um, uh, important for the moment, but it disappears um, when when that person discharges or when the when the person um, isn't able to see that in, in their my chart function. Anything to add, anyone? I don't keep any extra anything. I actually don't. I mean, I, I have my list for the that I print every day, and I certainly will jot down notes or like a really interesting quote or really, you know, something interesting that I want to share, maybe an IDT. Um, sometimes I, you know, when we discuss cases and we check in every morning, I have, you know, I might have like a juicy story or interesting observation. So that's really the extent of it. It's really only insofar as like I really want to communicate something. And also, I guess I do make mental notes because, you know, if a ne the next clinician comes on service on Monday and I'm the continuity um, with a particular patient. So sometimes I do try to keep an eye on like something really important in that way. But in terms of like anything more comprehensive than that, I don't, that's not a part of my practice. This is a, I, I do have a one more, it's a research point. Um, and Jeannie, I don't I imagine you have more thoughts on this because uh, you've been the editor of, of that book um, that you had helped put together. If it's a situation where I am wondering about partnering with a patient and the possibility of working up a case study, I, I, you know, somehow taking notes would be really important. Um, and I'm not exactly sure how to do that, but the case that I was lucky enough to have published in the book that you had put together, Jeannie, it, it was me going back to the progress notes and um, you know taking actual quotes and kind of, and also trying to, of course, as best we can reimagine and reconstruct uh, based upon that. But that would be a case where I think. Taking notes would be um, important and, like you said, discoverable, but I think at least you would have it with a purpose to say that this is going toward clinical research. Yeah, I think this goes back to a point that Chaba or someone made in our webinar, which is, it's like three layers of things going on here. One is the thick of the interaction, the narrative, the story, our practice, all of the assessment tools we're bringing in, the process, what am I doing, what intervention matches this, all of that, you know, kind of thick. Right. And then we're taking from that, what do I need to attend to? Um, what's important here? What am I going to address? You know, I'm, I'm using kind of a, 
a meta-analysis for myself of what's actually happening, my interpretive framework. And then there's what's relevant to document, right? So practice does not equal documentation. And a teaching assessment to our students, to our colleagues, our own assessments does not mean that that's what you document. And I would just say that should have always been kind of how we're functioning, but I think even more so now, right, as we're um, doing open notes, we're very selective in what we put in the medical record, just like our colleagues are. Um, and so if, if you need to track other things for some reason, great, but what would the purpose be? Be sure you're tracking them, again, my own growth, my own, I'm struggling with these kinds of patients, I wanna write a case study, um, et cetera. Other questions, Christina? Yeah, I think um, there's some continued questions about shadow charting, but I think Jeannie, you kind of answered that we are constantly discerning what goes in to the notes and what doesn't. Um, there's some questions about, you know, really specific spiritual or theological um, depth that we get in a visit that might be relevant for other chaplains, but not relevant for other non-chaplain team members. Um, and how to keep track of that. And that might be like, you know, things in Epic like sticky notes, or it might be email, like if you're doing a handoff to someone, maybe, do, you know, doing an email. Um, there's a question about working in outpatient when there's long gaps between when you see people and wanting to be able to remember things like that. Um, and so there might, I guess, might be time when you keep a separate uh, chart. Um, there's a great question about, uh, this kind of flows into some of our research goals, which is, do we think that, um, especially with how the proliferation of EMRs and with open notes, that we will have more standardization of the format of chaplain notes, and that will be a better place to do research and to study our notes. Also a question about, is there any way to, um, Evaluate, uh, is there any rubric or criteria to evaluate our own notes? That's a very great question. Evaluate for what is what I would say, right? Evaluate their impact that they're having once they're in the medical record on team communication, on care. Evaluate, are they respectful? Are they private? I mean, what are we evaluating for? No, we don't have any rubric to evaluate. And that I think is, those are definitely some of the research questions. Paul, I, I've seen you want to like eager to jump in here. Well, no, well, I can say um, <coughs> you mentioned at the front of this webinar that there's this APC Epic Task Force. I'm a part of that, and uh, so some of the information I've learned from that process. And if I'm misquoting anybody who's listening in on this, that uh, I think Epic said they've got essentially more than 200 like flow sheet or discrete data that they have that chaplains in our own respective departments have. So. A part of, I think, EPIC's interest in partnering with APC was, can we move toward the standardization process a little bit so that we can, as a profession, move forward with a more singular voice? Yes, we are we are uh, terrorizingly um, individualistic in many ways, and that makes us really, uh, that's, that's important for many reasons, but yes, we need to continue to move forward in that direction. So I feel lucky to be a part of that task force and trying to move toward that direction knowing that and recognizing that there will be things left out, but we're doing our best. I think one of the things that we've talked a little bit about in past webinars as well on documentation is the balance between what's really the purpose of checkboxes and what's the purpose of narrative, who reads them, who won't read them. And one of the nice things about standardization, if we had some shared understanding of what the checkboxes meant, we could actually do some research using those, right? But right now, do we even know what a checkbox means when you say somebody has high anxiety? Is that a, is what you count as high anxiety also what Paul would say is high anxiety, right? So we don't have even um, kind of a, a heuristic frameworks to, to begin to even use some of what the tools we have to do research. Um, we got a lot of work to do. Well, and I just think, you know, I know at MGH, and I don't know if this is partners wide, but um, at the, our Epic recently changed. And so, you know, the spiritual like issues section, it went from being like maybe 10 checkboxes to like 25. And so 
I feel like that's the opposite of what we need to do. I was like, no. But, and so then, and there's like these incredibly specific check boxes. But if anything, it's going to make it way harder to track what we're doing and to like really get any sort of unified sense. I know there's some check boxes that I never use. I will never use them. I will fight to the death and I will not check certain things. Um, you know, and so the yeah it's just very i mean there's demographic stuff right that we could put in maybe like the, this person or this person wants communion on sundays like yeah we can do that as a checkbox but they you know some of the check boxes check boxes say things like um you know like abandonment by god or like one of them is dark night of the soul which is like that's that's that is not something i personally would put um <laughs> but i mean it's interesting right i mean that is a strong statement and we know what it means as chaplains i think maybe and it's um maybe but i think if anything we need to make our check boxes like simpler and clearer and then maybe have some broader and and also one thing that i think is tricky about the check boxes is a lot of them and at least the ones we use are like they uh they have a certain tone of judgment like they're like negative or positive like um role of spirituality is like you know guilt abandonment positive you know religious resource like so it's either like there's one positive one and the rest of them are all just sort of negative kind of slightly judgmental checked boxes and so i feel like except, again, i don't except, check off half the stuff well so just think about what it would be like i mean already i don't think our clinicians when if you check boxes they populate as anxiety guilt dark night of the soul right facilitated expression of grief what does that tell them and now what if you were a patient reading those check boxes which will be populated in your chart right will they have a clue what it means will they ignore them will they will not care and what does it really how would they recognize themselves i mean we keep talking about part of the open notes thing is patient recognition right oh yeah i did talk about that so unless there's some explanation of what spiritual distress means right yeah mm -hmm. paul jump in uh yeah i i do have some thoughts <laughs> or not <laughs> <laughs> i do what gets presented to our interprofessional partners and what is kept for a data set um so for yeah that that's really important um what i did want to mention was that piece around language because i think sarah you raised a really good point I was taking a really strong examination. So my own tradition, being a Christian, yeah, I'm into some Christian mysticism, and I like St. John of the Cross. And so, so Dark Night of the Soul, it certainly has a bias um, to it, and it, that may not be shared by other traditions. I mean, just as a way for us to examine that and say, like, what is, what kind of bias is perhaps uh, emerging here in this uh, process? The other thing I think it, language is, as we know, is critical. Um, and it, it depends on what region of the country you're in. Um, and it, even within that region, you can slice it and dice it. But I still remember the Centers to Advance Palliative Care commissioned this really cool study that was really professionally based. It wasn't research it had, um, but it was around language. Because I don't like one of the things that really stood out for me was as a palliative profession moving forward, what word were we going to use to describe the kind of illness that people have? I don't know if anybody ever read this report. Is it life threatening? Is it life limiting? Is it terminal? Or is it serious? And the winner was. Serious. Serious. Yeah. Serious. I mean, yeah. yeah. So for us as a profession to be to move forward with, well, I like this. You know, I say, you know, potato. You say potato, and that's kind of where some of the nuance is. Um, mm -hmm. I could say more, but I'll stop there. Okay, I have one last question before Christina. Do you have more questions coming in? Well, I was going to say that it this kind of taps into there were some questions about using assessment instruments. And so that there are assessment tools, which either some institutions and departments are already using across the board, and how might that um, be read by patients? Like we, we talked earlier about, um, we were having a conversation about spiritual aim, and another person mentioned like the SDAT, PC7, RCOPE, FACET, SP. Um, so if you're using that, and it has certain language, and it has certain frameworks, how will that be understood? Um, but yeah, yeah, I think that conversation about language, like what is, I think to me, Open Notes is a, is a direction, a movement towards more general language that can be understood not only by non chaplain colleagues, but by patients. Um, and so saying, like the serious illness, like significant spiritual distress, 
versus dark night of the soul seems like a more generalizable term. Yeah. And we've already been challenging our colleagues in chaplaincy to avoid, what do we call it, in-house club language, you know, language that's not accessible to others. So salvation concerns. Do people know what that means? Right? Well, the, if you're a, if you're an atheist, you know what salvation concern means? We think we know what it means, right? Whereas terms like hope or hopelessness, despair, those are more accessible, right? Um, and I think patients would recognize themselves as well um, in some of those terms that are more general. I, I think about, we can save some of the more like sort of um, expressive or colorful or interesting terms. If a patient uses it, we can, if a patient says, I'm experiencing dark night of the soul, like, I will quote that. Quotation marks. Yeah. Yep. And that's, I mean, that's some real stuff. Or, you know, you know, we were talking through some of the Psalms and we talked through some of the phrases in the Psalms that, you know, this patient, you know, we kept saying joy comes in the morning. And so, you know, I wrote, this patient is comforted by belief that, you know, joy comes through the morning. That's beautiful. You know, and so that's, that's the good stuff. And I think, you know, that's what's important to hold up in the narrative is to give that kind of color and, and that and help the person's personality and it really their coping and the way they're thinking about it sh like shine through um yeah go ahead paul no i i i, I don't, before we run out of time i just want to um uh take the bait and respond to what christina raised related to the different spiritual assessment models that are mm -hmm. out there and we all know there's there's a kajillion and christina mentioned some of those that are published within the peer-reviewed um, literature the thing that i would caution people with um is to know is it a clinical tool like the PC7, like the spiritual aim, or is it designed to be much more for research like the ARCOP? ARCOP is not designed to be used, you know, by a chaplain, or like the FACET SP is not, it's not a, Sarah brings that to the palliative care patient and says, hey, let's sit down and do these 10 questions. That's that's not, it, so um, that flies in the face of what we do. But the other thing, to the specificity, and um, this goes back to a webinar that uh, George Fichet and Dirk Labashain, some of the authors on the PC7 were talking about, was it really is kind of more inpatient. Um, and the study that um, Allison Kestenbaum and Michelle Shields were involved in, in the 2017 Journal of Pain and Symptom Management, they used it in an outpatient setting, the geriatric rehab setting that the um, STAT was used in. So, I mean, I think it's always important to say, can that be generalized to, you know, the palliative care population, the mental health population? So I'll stop there, thanks. And I would just reiterate what we said before, which is assessment tools are for us, right? Documentation is not, it needs to inform, obviously assessment needs to inform what we document and somehow be visible, right? But then how the format, the language we use will look very different than what our assessment tool is. So you're not gonna use a phrase taken directly from the AIM I can't remember what dynamics or something. Nobody will know what that means, right? Yeah. Right. So, patient has a reconciliation dynamic. Like you wouldn't just leave it at that, right? That doesn't right. it would be unclear to someone who who doesn't know what that means. And it also doesn't really show how we're responding. So you'd want to say, so I did XYZ intervention with the understanding that this will help patients, you know, ex, you know, whatever, whatever kind of development in the plan of care we're hoping for. Along with that, I would just add that I am really resistant these days to, I'm starting to believe that using uh, reason for consult, inter, uh, assessment, intervention, outcome, plan, that's been for us to try to make those connections between each step of what we do, right, to build a better recognized outcomes. Is that the way to document in a medical record, like in a format like that? Or should we be doing more what I think Paul, you've suggested in some of your research, which is kind of highlighting what the topic is. Just uh, impact of religious beliefs on decision-making, uh, patient family coping. Again, that's what our team, they want to know where to go and look at it. They don't document with the, I mean, they document by systems, by things that are, again, pertinent to the care they're providing, not by what was my assessment, what was my intervention, what, so I've just been thinking a lot about that lately. And I think even more, would our patients know what that means? Intervention, assessment, outcome, like, really? But it, it's that great for a, a data set. <laughs> it, it is, it is. But to, I, I really want, I still want that information, even yeah. if it's not front facing for the patient or the, the staff member, because uh, if I'm a chaplain manager, which I'm not, I, you know, I kind of wanted it, it'd be really kind of cool to see that in a larger aggregated data set. 
and we know that's just not possible with progress notes to do that. It just would be way too laborious. Um, so there is a huge value in some ways, um, especially I wish in some ways there was a, another chaplain manager or something on, on the call um, because I think there would be value in that. Any last questions, Christina? I know we're almost at the like we are at the end of our time. I think that we we've covered everything. I was just, just going to say that in my some people in my department have been using something that says at the top focus of visit, and that kind of picks up that idea that if you had to summarize like either key themes or um, the like what you did in one sentence to put that at the top. Um, and psych does that too in my in in our institution yes. and they always put a patient quote um, at the very top which is also yeah. very interesting in terms of humanizing people i think yeah. um so i hope that we we tried to answer uh, some of the questions and i really appreciate everyone who submitted uh, there was a question when can we anticipate an update on the work with epic and apc paul do you want to say <laughs> i guess it just started <laughs> Please be patient with us. Uh, we want to do the best work we can. With, uh, uh, it's 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 a process. Uh, it's a process. Uh, but I, I I don't I'm, I don't lead that group. Uh, Brent Peary does, and so I, uh, I I so appreciate his leadership. Um, but it's a bigger process and it's unfolding. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everyone, to our panelists for joining us, putting this together. Thank you for those who are in attendance. We had a really good uh, group today. Um, and don't hesitate to use our platform, Transforming Chaplaincy, through Mighty Networks. We would like to organize a Q&A session or a brainstorming session to move the research agendas forward. That's the next thing on our list. So stay tuned for that. We'll offer a couple opportunities to really dive in and um, advance the goals we've been talking about. Thank you, everyone. Good luck with your charting. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.